everybody, let's stand and sing. Your favor waits within the future. My dreams are small compared to yours. Why should I worry about tomorrow when I know that all I gotta do is trust you, Lord? All right, let's stand and sing this together. Every little thing's gonna be How are we doing? You guys doing good today? Awesome. I want to introduce some people real quick. Uh, my name is Ryan, one of the worship leaders here. This is Crystal. Can everybody say, what's up, Crystal? And this is her brother, Joe. Everybody say, what's up, Joe? We almost missed that one. Let's try it again. There we go. We got it. We got it. Uh, and then every, most of you guys know Brian. Everybody said, what's up, Brian? And this is Annie. Everyone say, what's up, Annie? So now that we know everybody, why don't you turn the person next to you? We're going to get started with a few more songs. If this is your first time, welcome to Kensington. Feel free to turn the person next to you, give them a handshake, a high five, tell them what's up, and we're going to get started with some more music. We're glad that you're here. Hey everybody, this is Patrick, and I just wanted to say thanks again for watching our service today online and being a part of this community. Now, we know that you might have some questions as you watch the service today and want to find out a little bit more information about who we are. And so we've created an environment for you to do just that. Simply go to startingpoint.today. That's startingpoint.today and fill out a short form, and one of our staff members will reach out to you very shortly and answer any questions that you have about our church and about who we are. Again, thanks so much for watching. We'll be back at the end of the service today uh, to give you a little bit more information, but we'll see you here in just a few minutes.
want to keep going. Where are you guys going? <laughs> uh, thanks for being here. My name is Greg. Uh, welcome to Kensington Church. This really is a safe place to explore your faith, and you chose an awesome day to be with us. It's, if it's your first time with us, an extra special welcome. Um, anything you hear about today, we'd love to connect more with you, and we've got the perfect environment in the lobby. It's called The Hub. And so I'll get out of the way of this TV um, so you can find out more about this place. But you guys can have a seat. Thanks for singing with us. Thanks for uh, being here. Well, we always say, but it's true that you guys are among the most generous people in Traverse City. And it's because of your generosity to this place that we can make an impact in our community and around the world. And so at this time, I'm actually going to ask the ushers to come forward for this morning's offering. And there's three ways to give. You can give um, right here for the, in the offering baskets, or you can text the word Kensington to the number 77977. You can follow the prompts. You can give on the Kensington app, or you can give at kensingtonchurch.org slash giving. 
Well, one of the things that our giving does directly is an event that we have uh, coming up that we call Thanksgiving Baskets. Now, this is a long, like, Kensington tradition, uh, and the way that we do it here at our Traverse City campus is actually we're partnered directly with our school partner, Traverse Heights <coughs> Elementary School. And so we reach out to the school, and we, get <coughs> we collect names of families who would really benefit from a Thanksgiving basket. And what this is, we fill a, a, a laundry basket with all the items that you need for an amazing Thanksgiving dinner. But more than that, we actually uh, include food that will carry that family through the weekend. We know that a lot of these families that are part of our school partner actually rely on the school for food and sustenance. And so we want to make sure that no one goes hungry through that weekend. And so there's a couple ways that you guys can be involved. Um, and one is you can give toward Thanksgiving baskets. It costs about $50 per basket. And so you can give. And the best way to give is um, actually you can stop in the lobby. We have a table set up if you want to give like cash or check. Um, but probably it's easiest if you go to kensingtonchurch.org slash thanksgiving and you can follow the prompts there and give toward this awesome uh, event that we have and then second so you can give toward it or you can show up on november 23rd and as we all gather together and we head over to traverse heights elementary school and then all the food is kind of lined up for us and then you get a basket you fill that basket and you and your family actually and go and deliver that basket to the family who needs it. And so just speaking personally, I know like this is one of my favorite things to do with my family. I've got like two elementary age kids and then a three year old. And this is like the perfect opportunity to serve as a family. And the, and the kids know that they're doing something very tangible to help someone else. And so I encourage you, if you're a young family or um, if you're a retired family, you can bring uh, the grandkids. This is a great opportunity to come and serve and bring kids along. So we want you to be a part of that. Again, you can go to kensingtonchurch.org slash thanksgiving and find out all about it. Well, next thing I want to let you know is that Render is coming up. Anybody been to our Render service? A lot of us have, right? Your Render, it's such an amazing time together. Uh, we actually meet across the hall. Uh, we do kind of an extended time of music and teaching. Uh, we also we uh, celebrate communion together. And so Render is coming up actually uh, November 13th. And so that's a Wednesday night. So if you haven't been to a render or a render is um, something that you attend all the time, we really encourage you uh, to come to render this month. It's going to be an amazing time together. Well, this is the very first week of a new series I'm excited about. It's called Mastermind. And Mastermind is all about, like, how do we get our thoughts in line? How do we, how do we rely on God to continue to work our way into being more healthy, living that life that God desires us to be? And so it's going to be an amazing series, and I'm really excited about it. And even better than that, we have our friend Andrew Kim, who's down there at the front. So everybody say, hey, Andrew. Hey. <laughs> So we are excited. Andrew is a part of our team downstate. He actually serves at our Troy campus. He's a gifted communicator and speaker. And so I'm just excited that we all get to hear from him today. But let's take a look at this video and get things started. Your mind is a complex machine. Even while you're watching this, your brain is calculating one billion billion calculations per second that you aren't even aware of until maybe right now. You think that you're watching an animation and listening to my voice, but really your mind is orchestrating the entire experience and simultaneously keeping your body functioning at its best potential. Our thoughts have powerful implications on our lives but learning to understand the way we think and how it affects our life can be a difficult journey. What if we could better understand the world around us and truly take every thought captive? What if we could have a better conversation around mental health and it was no longer a stigma? What if we could have a better understanding of what makes us unique, how to manage our thoughts and what it would look like to live in the process of healing and health in our mind? So happy Sunday, everyone. How are you guys all doing? Good? Fantastic. And it's a privilege for me to be here, and I'm really excited about this brand new series that we're kicking off today, in that we're going to be talking about this gift that God has given us called our mind, and how we can experience greater health and healing in this area. 
But it's a, it's, as I mentioned, it's a privilege for me to be here because this is actually my very first time at this campus, my very first time in Traverse City, believe it or not. And exactly, right? it's been amazing so far. And yesterday when we were driving up here, the, it was beautiful. And that, a lot of leaves have already uh, fallen down. There are already the trees, some of the trees are bare. It was snowing slightly, but it was beautiful. And we're actually staying at a hotel right across from the West Bay. And so while we're driving in, I was telling my kids, and they're little, I was like, isn't this amazing? Isn't this so beautiful? And all they're saying is like, yeah, 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 yeah. Where's the pool? Right? But nevertheless, hopefully, I am hoping that we will be able to explore this area a little bit more. But my family, we moved to Michigan about two years ago. And so we've had a great time here. But I wanted to introduce you to them. I actually want to show you a picture of them and introduce you to some of my favorite people on this planet. And this is my family right here. And this is about, this was actually taken a year ago because we don't take a lot of pictures. And so my kids are a little bit older, but that, that's my wife, Robin, and we've been married for 13 years and she truly is a gift to me. And our oldest, we have three little ones, Eliana, who's eight, Isaiah, who's six, and our little wrecking ball, Mia, who is a year and a half. And I love these guys. And originally, I'm from Vancouver, in Vancouver, Canada, which is the real Vancouver, not the fake one in Washington. And if you've been there, you understand, or if you've seen pictures of it, you understand that it is one of the most beautiful places on this planet. And my wife, Robin, is from Minnesota. And we actually met while we were working with a humanitarian organization down in Texas. And after that, we've moved around a ton. From Texas, we moved out to West Africa to do work there. And then we moved to Boston, then we moved to Minneapolis, then to North, Northern Jersey, right outside of New York, then to Philadelphia. And then we finally made it to Michigan. And so our goal and our hope is, is that we would never, ever move again. But we'll see how that goes. <laughs> and so, I'm really excited about this series. And so to kick off this series, I wanted to ask you all a question. So you guys still with me? Ready for this question? Yeah. Awesome. Okay, so the question is, what are you thinking about right now? Just think about what you're thinking about. And you don't have to share it with me because honestly, for some of you, I don't, I I don't want to know what you're thinking about. <laughs> but I can imagine for some of you, you're looking at me thinking, you know what, I really like this guy. Right? He's engaging, he's charming, pretty good looking, and how could you not like a guy with this type of hair, right? That's what you're thinking. That's what you were thinking, right, ma'am? Exactly. I read your mind. But in all seriousness, for others of us, we're probably thinking about the crazy morning we just had. Because even with the extra hour of sleep, it was so hard trying to get our kids up, fed, dressed, and out the door. Maybe for others of us, we're thinking about that big fight that we just had on our way here with our significant other or one of our children. Some of you guys are smiling, which means that I know that's what you experienced today. And still for others of us, we might be thinking about that work email or that work text that just buzzed on our phone, and that's where our mind is. And still for others of us, we might be thinking, this is the last place I wanted to be this morning. And the only reason why you came is because someone promised to buy you breakfast afterwards. And if that is you, I am so excited that you're here. But this, all this to say, our thoughts are powerful. They're incredibly powerful because our thoughts, they affect our emotions, our actions, and ultimately our future. Because our minds are a battlefield. And this is what the Apostle Paul tells us in the passage that we're going to be looking at today. Because most of life's battles are won or lost in the mind. And so often the life that we live is a reflection of the thoughts that we think. And I love what one pastor and author by the name of Craig Rochelle said about our thoughts. This is what he said. And also, before we actually get to this quote, I should also mention that I'm indebted to one of his messages because he has some powerful thoughts, wonderful insights about the mind. And so a lot of this message is based off of one of his messages as well. But this is what he said about our thought life. Your life is moving in the direction of your strongest thoughts, which means that if we want to change our life, we have to change our thinking, change our thinking and will change our life. And so today, as we launch and enter into this brand new series, the question that we want to wrestle with is this question. Where are your thoughts taking you? Where are our thoughts taking us? And our thoughts, are our thoughts taking us in the direction that we desire? Are they moving us to the future that we desire in our lives, the future that we want to experience? And if not, I have some great news for us, because in the passage that we're going to be looking at, the Apostle Paul tells us is that if we're not moving in that direction, that he tells us how we can choose to move in an alternate direction, in an alternate way, so that we can truly experience the future that God wants us to experience in our lives. 
And the passage that we're going to be looking at comes from a book in the New Testament called 2 Corinthians. And 2 Corinthians was originally a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to a church community in the ancient Greek city of Corinth way back in the first century AD. And this church community was one that Paul had started years before he wrote this letter. And, but after Paul left to go to travel to other cities to start other church communities, there was a group of people who infiltrated this community and they started spreading lies about who Paul was and what it meant to follow Jesus. And so Paul started receiving all of these reports that things were not going well in this community. And so what he did to try to get them back on track was that he wrote them multiple letters. He even went to visit them. And one of the letters that he wrote, actually the third letter that he wrote, is what we call 2 Corinthians in our Bibles. And in this letter, in a section of it, he talks about the mind. He talks about our thought life. And this is what he says. He writes this, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. And so he gives us, the image that he uses is that of a war to describe what, what is happening in our minds. And he tells us that even though we live in the natural world, that we have access to supernatural weapons. And what these weapons are able to do is this, that he tells us, on the contrary, these weapons, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. And this word power is the Greek word that's translated power is the word dunamis. And it's where we get the English word dynamite from. And it's used to describe the explosive, the miraculous power of God. These are the weapons that we can access. And with these weapons, he says, that we are able to demolish strongholds. And that word stronghold, when you think about it, it's not a word that we use a lot in our culture today. But the reason why, the reason Paul uses it is he uses it to describe a fortified, a, a reinforced, a protected prison. And what he's trying to say is, is that when we believe lies, lies about who God is and about who we are, we find ourselves locked up in this prison by these lies. And I love what one scholar said. He wrote that when we're in this type of stronghold, we're a prisoner locked up by deception. We're held hostage by these lies. But you know what the great news is? And what Paul is saying is that we don't have to be held prisoner by these lies anymore. We don't have to believe them. But in fact, with God's help, we can crush them, we can defeat them, that we can experience freedom in our lives. And if this is what we want to experience in our lives, the very first step that we have to take is that we have to recognize the stronghold. We have to recognize the lie by doing this, by determining the deception by identifying the lie that is holding us back and that is keeping us locked up. And I had a terrible high school experience, hated every minute of it, because in high school I went through so many things that, that really compelled me, that really moved me in the direction of believing so many lies in my life. And if during my high school years, if you were to ask me to describe myself, and if I was honest with you, five words that I would have used to describe myself back in my teenage years would have been that I was fat, ugly, worthless, rejected, and alone. And I grew up in Vancouver, as I mentioned, and Vancouver has a large Asian population, which meant that I grew up surrounded by short, skinny Asian people. And I am not short, and I am not skinny. And so, in high school, there was a group of people who regularly would come up to me and say terrible things to me, like, why are you so fat? Why are you so obese? And every single time they said this, I would try to laugh it off because I didn't want them to see how much they hurt me. And at first, I didn't believe what they were saying to me. But after hearing it over and over and over again, I began to internalize it. And I began thinking to myself, if that's what they're saying, you know what, it must be true. Also, in high school, I had terrible acne so bad that on certain days I refused to even leave my house because I didn't want people to see my face. And when I would have a conversation with someone, I would never look them in the eye because I was so embarrassed. And like most high school boys, I liked girls. And I remember on a lot of mornings before I would go to school, I would look in the mirror and think to myself, who would want this? And also during high school, I was bullied for two and a half years, worst two and a half years of my life. 
And I can't even remember during that time how many times, it got so bad that I can't even remember the number of times I thought about taking my own life. And right before I would go to sleep on most nights, I would go through this routine where I would sit on my bed and I would basically, I would pray. And what that would result in is that it would just result in me crying because I would sit there asking God the same question over and over and over again. And what that question was, was why did you have to take my dad? Because my dad passed away of stomach cancer when I was four. And I believed as a kid that if my dad had been alive, that I wouldn't have been bullied or at the very least, it wouldn't have gone on for two and a half long years because as my dad, he would have either shown me what I was supposed to do as a man because I had no idea or he would have stepped in and he would have stopped it because he was my dad and he loved me, but he wasn't there. And for those two and a half years, I didn't have a single friend at school, no one. And I remember during, my, during recess and also during my lunch hours, in order to get away from these guys who were making my life so miserable, I would go to this area of our school where the woodworking and the metalworking shops were because no one hung out there. There were no lockers there. So I knew that if I was there, even though I was alone, at least I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have to be afraid of running into these guys. And so during my high school years, this is what I believed. I believed I was fat, ugly, worthless, rejected, and totally alone. And I remember a year and a half ago, we did a series called Defining Moments. And I told my story in that series. And I was asked to submit a picture of myself from back in high school. And I was digging through my pictures when I finally found one. It's this picture right here. This is me back in high school. And when I saw this picture for the very first time, for the first time in so many years, all of those memories came flooding back. All those experiences, all those emotions came flooding back. And it took me back to a time where I believed total lies about myself, lies that kept me locked up, lies that held me back from experiencing what God desired in my life. And so let me ask all of us a question. What are the strongholds in our lives? Because we all have them. What are the lies that we have believed for so many years? Maybe about who we are or about who God is. And it may be that we're not good enough. It may be that in our past, when we look back on it, we believe that we've done too many terrible things, hurt too many people that God could never, ever want us, that God could never use us, that he could never, ever love us. Maybe the lie that you believe is similar to what I believe for so many years, that you're rejected, that you're worthless, and that you're totally alone. But what is it for you? Because if we want to experience freedom in our lives, we have to identify it. We have to call it out. We have to determine the deception because we cannot defeat what we cannot define. And when we identify this lie, when we determine the deception, what God is able to do is something that is truly extraordinary, something that only he can do, which is he can destroy that lie. And Paul talks about how we can do this in this next verse, in that he says, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And this is the important part that we want to focus on for the next little bit. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. And so when Paul says he continues to use this war imagery and he tells us that every thought that enters into our mind, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to take it captive. Every lie that comes into our mind, we're to take it captive as a prisoner of war. And that Greek word for captive means to arrest or to seize with a sword or a spear. And what's so interesting is that when I was reading that definition, it reminded me of something else that Paul says in another one of his letters that we have in the New Testament called Ephesians. And in that letter, he tells us that as followers of Jesus, that we are in a spiritual battle. And in this battle, God hasn't left us hanging but rather he has given us armor to help us in this battle that we're in. He's given us the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth. He's given us, uh, our feet are fitted with the gospel of peace. We have a shield of faith and we have the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And all of this armor is defensive except for one, the sword of the spirit, which as I mentioned is the word of God. And with this sword, what we are to do, as he says in this verse, is we are to take captive, we're to arrest, we're to seize every lie, every thought that isn't from God. 
So that when a lie enters into our mind, what we're supposed to do is we're to identify, we're to call it out, we're to determine the deception and to say, you know what? That isn't who God says I am. That's not who God says he is. So you know what? I'm not going to believe it. I'm not going to choose to move in this direction because this doesn't lead me to the destination that God wants. Instead, I'm going to choose to believe what he tells me about himself and about who I am in his word. That who he is, is that he is loving, that he is kind, that he is forgiving, that he'll never leave, he'll never abandon me, that he hears my prayers. And because of who he is, who I am, is that I am loved, I am accepted, I am forgiven, I have incredible worth and value. And this is what I'm going to believe. So I'm not going to believe that lie and move in that direction, but I'm going to choose to believe something completely different and move in a different direction. This is what I'm going to do. And that's so important for us because something that we have to understand is that our thoughts will either move us towards God or away from him. And so if we want to be moving towards God, what we have to do is that we have to determine the deception, but also we have to do something else, is that we have to determine a new direction. Choose not to believe that lie and choose not to go down that path, but to choose a different path. And to say, I'm going to think and I'm going to believe this. And this is what the Apostle Paul actually says in another letter that he wrote that we call the book of Romans in the New Testament. He says this. He says, do not conform to the pattern of this world. And when he says that, what Paul is saying is, don't think the way that the world thinks. Don't believe the way that the world believes. Don't move in the direction that the world is moving. But instead, he says, be transformed. How? By the renewing of our mind, by allowing God to transform our thoughts. So powerful what he says. And how to do this is doing what we've talked about today, determining the deception, identifying the lie, and then beginning to move in a new direction. And there's actually a scientific explanation for this. And so we're going to be watching a video where Patrick had a great conversation with a clinical psychologist named Dr. Latanya Carter. And we're actually going to be hearing from her throughout this entire series. And she has some powerful insights into the mind. And in this video we're about to see, she tells us that when we do the two things that we've been talking about this morning, there's actually a physiological change that happens in our brains. So let's take a look at this. Well, Dr. Carter, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm so excited to be able to talk with you a little bit about this. And today what we've been doing is we've been talking about the power and the influence of our thought life. And specifically, one of the ideas that we've talked about is what it looks like to take our thoughts captive and to renew our minds so that we move in a healthy direction. And so my question for you is like, scientifically, what does that actually mean and how does that happen in our brains? Right, yeah. So let me give you a little bit of a neuroscience lesson really quick, okay? Um, so the emotions that we experience are housed in our amygdala, which is in the back of the brain. And when we experience a triggering event in the environment, our amygdala lights up um, and it starts sending uh, messages to other parts of our brain for us to react in order to basically extinguish that emotion. So usually it starts, the chain reaction starts with an emotion and it ends with some type of behavior. Neuroplasticity, which is what you're alluding to, um, is the ability to be able to change how our brain reacts and respond to um, a, a triggering event. So for for decades, researchers thought that once we reach adulthood, our brain stopped developing, it stopped changing. And so in recent years, they've discovered that that's not the case. And even more exciting is that we have power and influence over how our brain works. So if we look at, a, at an example of someone maybe with social anxiety, so for them, the triggering event might be joining a small group. You know, that's going to trigger a lot of anxiety, a lot of fear. Um, they're going to be afraid of judgment. People are going to be, um, they're not going to like me, whatever the case is, right? And so the response to that might be avoidance. I'm not going to go to the small group because I'm afraid of what's going to happen. But when I don't go to the small group, my anxiety decreases, the amygdala stops re reacting, and, um, and that's the end of it. So with neuroplasticity, we can um, make a change. And so we can change the neural pathway so that it goes to a different response. And we do that through engaging the prefrontal cortex, which is those, it's in the front of the brain. 
that's where we make decisions, we problem solve, um, we go through uh, executive functioning features, things like that. So when we, the same example, social anxiety comes into play, um, we wanna join the small group. So instead of avoiding, which is our original reaction, instead we decide, um, I'm gonna think through why I'm afraid. Right, I'm gonna break down these fears. I'm gonna come up with a plan so that my new reaction will be to go to small group, but um, maybe do some coping skills to manage my anxiety while I'm there. Okay, so in doing that, we've created a new pathway. Okay. We're no longer just avoiding going to small group. Now we're gonna go and we're gonna have a plan to control the anxiety. And the more we repeat that pairing of you know the emotion with the new behavior, the stronger the connections get. So another idea that we're talking about is specifically shifting from like one pattern or direction of thinking to another. And then scripture, again, as we already said, talks about this as like renewing of your mind or thinking in a different way. But from your perspective, like what does the actual renewal process look like? And then what role do these patterns play in our lives? The idea of taking every thought captive or renewing your mind actually aligns very well with cognitive behavioral therapy. Okay. Um, and certainly there are other types of therapies that you can use you know to renew the mind um, but I, I think this is a good example of how it could work um, so CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy the theory behind it is that our emotions are are basically determined by what we're thinking and what um, behaviors we're engaging in and so since I can't directly change your emotion I have to change how you think and how you behave in order to affect your emotion so CBT, um, in that process, we literally, through therapeutic exercises, take the thought ca thoughts captive. So we evaluate um, the repetitive thoughts that we sometimes have, um, and we evaluate them for truth to determine if this is a true thought or if it's a distorted thought. And then we reframe or restructure that thought based on the new evidence that we've discovered. So for example, we might have a thought that um, I'm flawed or I'm damaged. Mm -hmm. And so that thought causes a lot of depression symptoms, right? Yeah. And so we'll evaluate that thought, we'll take it captive, and we'll look at the evidence. Okay, how do we know that this thought is true? And how do we know that it's false? And for Christians, this is a great way to introduce scripture. So we can go to the Bible, we can look at the ways that we are made, um, you know, fearlessly and wonderfully made. We can look at scriptures that counter the negative thoughts that we're having and use that as evidence. And then we reframe the thought or restructure it so it's no longer um, I'm flawed or I'm damaged, but it's I was flawed, but now through Christ I'm made whole, okay. right? So we have literally changed sure. our thought patterns and our thought thinking. Yeah, that's great. So I know like personally for me, I, I want to get better at this. This doesn't always come natural to me. I know thoughts kind of come in and I'm, I'm very good at not evaluating those thoughts <laughs> at times, right? But I think for me, I would go like, how do I make sure that I'm kind of creating more self-awareness and more self-regulation when it comes to the mind? And then how can I be more intentional about creating Creating better pathways in that way. Right. So we've talked about therapy as being an option, and I think that's definitely applicable for people who um, have more of the clinical levels of anxiety or depression or things like that. Um, but in general, everybody can form new pathways, right? So doing things like um, self-care, you know, developing a routine of self-care. And in my opinion, any routine of self-care should include exercises for the mind, the body, and the spirit. Um, and so you might buy a journal and start you know, tracking your thoughts and recording how you're feeling, um, what you're thinking about, especially if you've had a day or a week where you're really emotional. A lot of times we just kind of get to the weekend, we're like, oh great, I don't have to think about that anymore, I'm good. Sure. Um, and we don't take the time to really reflect on what was happening. Um, so when we reflect on our emotions and we think about what triggers that, you know, we can start to ask our questions about, okay, how did I arrive at this outcome? Um, I was feeling anxious and then all of a sudden, you know, I'm eating a pound of ice cream. You know, how does this happen, right? Um, that would not be me. <laughs> no, okay. No, never, 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 never. <laughs> uh, but those are, those are exercises where you can choose, now that you understand the, the connection between the emotion and the behavior, you can choose to do something differently and that's going to form a new pathway. Um, learning new activities also, you know, complex uh, activities like 
learning an instrument or learning a foreign language, those create new pathways. Anything, anytime we're learning something new, um, even Bible study, if we're doing Bible study and, and we're engaging critical thinking skills, those are forming new pathways. Um, and of course, eating healthy and exercising, those produce um, you know, happy hormones in our brains that actually counter some of the negative feelings that we're having. Yeah. That's great. Dr. Carter, thank you so much for thank being you. with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I love what she had to say, and she provides so much incredible insight. And as I mentioned, we're going to be hearing from her throughout this entire series. And Patrick is the one who really put this series all together, including these conversations. And he has done an incredible job, especially on this topic, which can be a very difficult topic. But as, I, as Dr. Carter mentioned in this video, when we do the two things that we've been talking about today, and that when we determine the deception and then we determine to move in a due direction, something extraordinary happens in our minds. In that there is a change, a physiological change. In that there's new pathways that are, uh, that are created. And ultimately what we're doing is we, we're rewiring our brains. And in college, um, I was a biology major. So that was money well spent. But nevertheless, <laughs> I was a biology major. And, um, one of the things, what I, one of the classes that I remember taking, and I found this class so fascinating, it was a neurobiology course. And one of the things that I learned in this class is that when we as human beings learn something for the very first time, as Dr. Carter mentioned, a new neural pathway is created in our brains. And so, for example, when a child learns for the very first time that 2 plus 2 equals 4, that pathway is created. And when that child, as that con child continues to study that information, continues to learn that information, that pathway gets stronger and stronger and stronger until it becomes automatic. And so someone could just jump out from behind a tree and say to that child, what's two plus two? And without even having to think about it, he or she would be able to say, you know, it's, it's four, because that pathway is so strong. And it's similar with other information as well. Because when we choose to think, when we choose to believe that who we are is that we are rejected, that we are alone, that we are worthless, a new neural pathway is created. And as we continue to travel down this road and move in that direction, that pathway becomes stronger and stronger and stronger until what we realize is that it becomes a default thought. And so someone could ask us, like they could have asked me back in my teenage years, who are you? Describe yourself. And we may not say it, but we would think, you know what, I am worthless. I am alone. That I am rejected. And so if we want to change our thinking and we don't want to continue to move down this pathway anymore, we have to create an alternate pathway. We have to begin to move in a new direction. And to say, you know what, I'm not going to move in this direction anymore, but I am going to choose to move and I'm going to choose to believe something completely different. And as we choose that alternate pathway over and over and over again, what happens is, is that this pathway, which is based on lies, begins to atrophy. And this other pathway becomes stronger and stronger and stronger until it becomes our default thought. And you know one of the incredible things is, is that back in the first century AD, when Paul was writing these letters, he didn't know any of this. He didn't have access to this information, but what's so extraordinary is that God gave him this knowledge. Because this is what he says, going back to that verse in the book of Romans. He says this, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Because what he's saying here is that this renewing is it's in a tense called the present tense, which means that we have to continually do this. It's a choice that we have to make over and over and over again daily. And that's what we have to do, that if we want to change our thinking, it's not just like a one-time decision that we say, oh, you know what, I'm not rejected, but I'm accepted. I'm not worthless, but I'm valued. I'm not alone, but God is with me. Oh, yeah, you know what, I'm just going to make that choice once and I'm good. That's not how it works, but we have to continually renew our mind, continually make these decisions. And when we do, as I mentioned, this pathway becomes weaker and this pathway becomes stronger. That's how our brains work. And two ways that we can do this, two ways that we can do what we apply these two principles that we've been talking about in our life. The two ways that we can determine the deception and determine a new direction are these. And I wanted to give you uh, just these two ways. And what they are is the first is that we have to learn the truth. 
And this is also what Dr. Carter said. And whether it could be, and by the truth, I mean God's truth, what he tells us about who he is and about who we are in his scriptures. And it could be reading the Bible. It could be listening to it, writing it down, memorizing it, whatever it is. But when a lie enters into our mind, the only way that we're going to understand that it's a lie is that if we know the truth, if we're able to compare it to the truth. And so this is what we have to do. And I remember the very first church that I ever worked at, my boss made everyone on staff memorize a ton of Bible verses. And we ended up, we were serious about this. And it was a Korean church, so we were almost militant about it. And so we ended up memorizing hundreds of verses. And the crazy thing was, was that if we even got one word wrong, we would have to pay a dollar. It was crazy, right? So everyone, I would do this. I had these flashcards, they were like this big, the stack was massive, and I would just go through them every single day. And when we started this, I hated it. I had a horrible attitude. And that my thinking was, why do I have to do this? Why do I have to memorize the Bible? Why can't I just read it? But then I saw the beauty that came out of it. And I remember on certain days where I would th be thinking to myself, I am such a failure. I'm terrible at my job. And I would be insecure. I would feel so inadequate. And I would be tempted to move down this path, to think and to believe this lie. One of the Bible verses that I had memorized would pop into my mind. And it would remind me, that this is who I am, that I'm not a failure, that I'm not inadequate, but in Christ, he is all sufficient for me. And I would be reminded of God's truth. And it would be through that truth, God would say to me, don't move in this direction, but rather choose this way because it is a better way to move. It is a better way to live. But if we're actually going to do this, we have to do this. We have to understand God's truth. We have to know God's truth. And we, last week, we wrapped up our Why Bible series. And one of the things that I challenged everyone at our Troy campus to do is if they weren't reading the Bible, to do so. And a great way that if you're thinking about, because the Bible is a big book, and sometimes it can get confusing, it could be a little bit intimidating. Where do I start? Where do I start reading? And a great place, if you want to start in the New Testament, is in the Gospel of John. And it details the life of Jesus. It's a narrative of his life and what he did on this earth. But if you want to start in the Old Testament, a great place to start is in the book of Proverbs. And a great way to read the book of Proverbs is to read the chapter that corresponds to the date. And so today, I, believe, I think it's November 2nd, correct? And so if it's November 2nd, read Proverbs chapter 2. And it'll probably take you about two minutes to read it. But the book of Proverbs has incredible wisdom as to how we can live our lives. And so, but we have to know the truth if we're actually going to understand, you know what, this is a lie, and to begin to move in a new direction. But a second way that we can apply what we've been talking about today is we also have to speak the truth. We have to have people in our lives who communicate to us, not just once, but over and over again, God's truth to us through their words and through their actions. And I had this happen to me. Because in high school, that bullying situation did a number on me. It impacted me physically, mentally, psychologically, spiritually. And for the longest time, for so many years after, I had zero self-confidence, zero self-esteem. And after college, I went to work for a humanitarian organization called Mercy Ships, one of the best experiences of my life. Got a chance to travel to different places. I got to see God work in different cultures and experience some extraordinary things. But with that organization, I also met some amazing people. People who, through their words and through their actions, communicated to me that, you know what, I am worthy to be loved, that I am accepted, and that I'm not alone, but other people are with me, but most importantly, that God is with me. And they communicated to me God's truth. And through their words and through their actions, they opened my eyes to the fact for so long that I had, believe, I had been believing lies about who I was, that I had been moving in the wrong direction, and it was through them that God said, you know what, there's a different way that you can live, a way that you can experience more of what I want you to experience in life, the life that I've created you to live. We have to have these people in our lives who speak it, who show it to us. But what's also so important is we don't, it's not just important to have these people in our lives, we have to be these people to others. 
whether it's to our husband or our wife, whether it's to our children, whether it's to our friends, our coworkers, our neighbors, what we talk about in this room, what we read about in the scriptures, what it means to be a follower of Jesus, it's not just taking information in, but the reason we are given these tools and we're given all of this isn't so that we can just hold it to ourselves, but rather so that we could communicate it to the people, to the world around us, the transformative power of Jesus. You gotta speak it. It's so incredibly important. And so when we think about today, this is the bottom line that I want to present to all of you, and it's this. Our lives will move in the direction of our thoughts. It's very similar to what the Craig Rochelle quote was earlier. Our lives will move in the direction of our thoughts because our mind is a battlefield, and so much of life is won or lost up here. And so often the life that we live is a reflection of the thoughts that we think. Because what enters into our mind will ultimately come out of our life. And if we want to live the life that God has created us to live, a life of purpose, a life of meaning, a life of freedom, a life that is characterized by his joy, his peace, his love, then we've got to change what happens in here. We have to. And it's so incredibly important. And if you're like me, because I still battle with this, those thoughts that I experienced back in high school, they're still thoughts that I wrestle with today. I still struggle with body image. It's just one of the reasons why I still work out so much. And that, was, that happened t- more than 20 years ago. Still struggle with this. Still tempted to move down this path. And I recognize that it's not just me, but it's every single one of us in this room who struggles with some lie, who struggles with some stronghold. And if we want to experience freedom from this, we have to determine that deception and we have to determine to move in a new direction. We have to take that thought captive and we have to choose to replace it with the truth because the truth is so incredibly powerful. This is what Jesus tells us that the truth is able to do. And he says, and you will know the truth. And what will the truth do? What does the, po- what does the truth have power to do? To set us to help us move in the direction that he desires and to experience everything that life has to offer. So let's bow our heads and let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for your truth. We thank you that you love us and that you have given us this gift called your word. And in it, you define reality. You tell us who you are and who we are as well. And so we pray that this gift, Lord, that we would read it, that we would learn it, that we would memorize it. And so that when a lie enters into our mind, that we would be able to do what you tell us to do, which is to take that lie captive, to choose not to believe it, to choose not to move in that direction, but rather choose to believe and to live out who you say we are and who you say that you are as well. So give us the courage to do that. Give us the strength to do that because it requires that. To change the way that we think is not an easy thing to do, especially lies that have been embedded in our brains for so long and where that pathway is so strong and so solidified and even automatic. It's hard to choose a different direction, but we recognize that with your help, everything is possible. And show us how to do that, even starting today. Help us to learn your truth and also be people who speak your truth to one another and so that we can experience true and genuine freedom in our lives. And so we thank you, Lord, for your care. We thank you for your love for us. And we pray these things in your name. Amen. Let's stand together and sing this last song. Before he spoke creation, the God of heaven knew our name. Formed in his reflection, 
We are His glory on display And His heart is good He is always kind With the cross He proved He is on my side We are the sons, we are the daughters of God no matter where we go, we're close to the Father's heart. And though we stumble, He will not let us fall. We are the Lord's and He will never forsake His own. We are the sons. We are the daughters of God. His love, He lavished on us and called us children of the King. And in His love and kindness, He chose the lowly and the weak. His heart is good, He is always kind, with the cross He proved, He is on my side. We are the sons, we are the daughters of God, no matter where we go, we're close to the Father. sons we are the daughters of God sing that chorus together one last time. Let's let every voice sing this out today. We are the sons, we are the daughters of God. No matter where we go, we're close to the Father's heart. And though we stumble, He will not let us fall. We are the we 
Just kidding. <laughs> I was supposed to do the goodbye and I just forgot. But I'm going to send you guys off. Is that okay? I pray a blessing over you guys. Is that cool? You guys game for that? Cool. Uh, Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this church, what you're doing in us and through us. And I really hope that that theme of us being sons and daughters, wiring us in a unique way and that there is a hope, there is a next level for all of us to know you, to make you known and to be better to each other. God, that's my prayer for us. Pray that you would just put things in our lives to remind us of Andrew's message and uh, that you would just ignite us with passion and desire to pursue those things. I ask these things in Jesus' name and everyone said, amen. Have a great week. See you guys next time. Thank you guys so much for joining us online. Uh, it's so awesome just to see the interactions on the Facebook uh, chat and all the different ways you guys share our content on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Keep doing it. We love it. Uh, we really, really, really appreciate all that you do by getting the word out. Uh, this was week one of Mastermind. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Week two is coming next week at 9 or 11 a.m. So I encourage you to come here physically in our campus and attend one of our services. But if you can't, always feel welcome to join us online. Hope you guys have a great week. See you next time.
Check, check, check. Do, 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 do.
All right, how you guys doing? Everybody doing good today? Yeah, this side is doing good. How about this side? You guys doing good here? Good. This side over here, you guys doing good though, right? Yeah. Coffee's kicking in. It's good. Well, my name is Ryan. I'm one of the worship leaders here. I want to introduce a few people. This is Crystal. Everybody say, what's up, Crystal? She's one of our newer worship leaders. And this is her brother, Joe. Everyone say, what's up, brother Joe? Yeah, he's awesome. We love having Joe on stage. And this is Brian Jackson. A lot of you know Brian. Everyone say, what's up, Brian? And this is Annie Knudsen. Everyone say, what's up, Annie? And yes, we now know each other. So why don't you turn to the person next to you and say, what's up? And tell them you're glad you're here. Give them a handshake, a high five, whatever feels comfortable. If this is your first time at Kensington, we're really excited that you're here. And uh, we'll hey everybody, this is Patrick, and I just wanted to say months. thanks again for watching our service today online and being a part of this community. Now, we know that you might have some questions as you watch the service today and want to find out a little bit more information about who we are. And so we've created an environment for you to do just that. Simply go to startingpoint.today, that's startingpoint.today, and fill out that short form, and one of our staff members will reach out to you very shortly and answer any questions that you have about our church and about who we are. Again, thanks so much for watching. We'll be back at the end of the service today uh, to give you a little bit more information, but we'll see you here in just a few minutes. Step out of the grave. 
You guys ready to sing this? Come on. I'll raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I'll raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I'll raise a I'll raise a hallelujah Heaven comes to fight for me for that song to be over. I just want to keep going. <laughs> well, welcome, everyone. My name is Greg. I'm a part of the staff here at Kensington Traverse City. We are so glad that you are here today. So uh, if you guys want to, you can go ahead and take a seat. Uh, we say every week, because it's true, that this really is a safe place for you to explore your faith. And so if you're here for your first time, an extra special welcome. This really is a safe place to, uh, to seek uh, answers to the questions that burn in our heart. Um, and so, and if you want to connect with us more too, because we always have a lot going on here. Uh, if you want to connect with us more, a great uh, environment for that is called The Hub. It's that big like round table out there with TV screens and you can connect with someone who can uh, answer questions you have about this place. Well, 
Um, you truly are among the most generous people in Traverse City. Your giving to this place allows us to do so many things locally and even globally. So at this time, I'd like to invite our ushers forward for this morning's offering. And is that mine doing that? Hunter's back there. There we go. All right. So you can give three ways here at Kensington Church, um, including the, the baskets that come around. But you can text the word Kensington to the number 77977. Maybe I'll stop moving and then it won't, uh, <laughs> it won't do that. Uh, and then you can give in less than 10 seconds in the Kensington app, or you can give at kensingtonchurch.org slash giving. So one of the things coming up that you're giving directly impacts is uh, an event that we call here... Um, Thanksgiving baskets, and it's a tradition um, at Kensington Church. So every Thanksgiving rolls around, and then we fill these baskets, laundry baskets, with food for a family to provide an awesome Thanksgiving meal. And so it's just such a cool way for us to uh, meet a direct need in our community. We focus in on our school partner, Traverse Heights Elementary, and so we collect families there who um, could really benefit from this. And so what we do is we, we gather all this, the food and supplies, and then on November uh, 23rd, we gather at Traverse Heights Elementary School. We pack the bag, or pack the baskets, and then we go out and we deliver them to these families. Now, as a, a dad with, like, young kids, this is such a cool opportunity to serve as a family um, and such a cool way to see how it impacts my own kids. And then and they, they get to give something of importance to another family who really needs it. And so there's a couple ways that you can be involved. And you can be involved in both ways. But one is to give um, money toward it. It costs about $50 per basket. And so um, if you want to give $50 for a basket or if you could buy a few more or if you just give what you can give. But that allows us to then um, support this event and then uh, really impact our community. So you can give money. And uh, the way you can do that most easily is you can go to kensingtonchurch.org slash Thanksgiving, and you can find all the information there. And then second, uh, the way you can be involved is actually you can come out on the 23rd, you can pack a basket, and you can deliver it to a family. So again, if you go to kensingtonchurch.org slash Thanksgiving, you can sign up to be a driver for that. So I really encourage you uh, to take part in this, um, this fun way that, to impact our community. And then next we have uh, our render service coming up. Anybody been to render before? I think most of us probably have, right? But if you haven't been to render, it's just a really cool kind of family time. We come together on a Wednesday night, and we meet actually across the hall in our student space. Um, we sing a few more songs. We listen to a message. We actually celebrate communion together. But if you're newer to this place or maybe you feel like you're not as connected, this is a great opportunity for you to come and meet some other families here at Kensington Church. So it's going to be on November 13th. That's a Wednesday night. I invite you to take part in that. Well, I'm excited because this is the first week in a series that we're calling Mastermind. And this is just, I'm excited about this because it, it is something that we all uh, wrestle with, whether it's, um, whether it's us or we've got a close family member, it's, but we all want to have our minds uh, renewed. We all want our minds to be in step, to live that best life we, that we know that God wants us to live. And so to get us going on that, we actually have um, our friend from downstate, Andrew Kim. So Andrew's down here at the front, but everybody can say, hey, Andrew. So Andrew is such a gifted communicator and speaker, so you guys are in for a treat. He's on, um, yeah, part of our team down at the Troy campus. And so let's watch this video to get things started. Your mind is a complex machine. Even while you're watching this, your brain is calculating one billion, billion calculations per second that you aren't even aware of until maybe right now. You think that you're watching an animation and listening to my voice, but really your mind is orchestrating the entire experience and simultaneously keeping your body functioning at its best potential. Our thoughts have powerful implications on our lives, but learning to understand the way we think and how it affects our life can be a difficult journey. What if we could better understand the world around us and truly take every thought captive 
What if we could have a better conversation around mental health and it was no longer a stigma? What if we could have a better understanding of what makes us unique, how to manage our thoughts, and what it would look like to live in the process of healing and health in our mind? Hey, happy Sunday, everyone. How are you guys all doing? Good, fantastic. And I am, as Greg mentioned, my name is Andrew, and I am at our Troy campus. I'm the teaching pastor down there, and I'm really excited for this service. And Patrick's actually the lead teacher on this, in this series, and he's done an amazing job really creating it. And we're going to be listening to a conversation that he had with uh, Dr. Carter, who has some incredible insights into the mind, because that is where we are going in this series. We are focusing on this gift that God has given us called our minds and how we can experience greater health and healing in this area of our lives. But just to give you a little bit of an understanding as to who I am, um, this is actually my very first time at this campus. This is actually my very first time in Traverse City. And so we, my family and I, we moved here two years ago. And in those two years, person after person has been, have been coming up to us and they've been saying, you got to get up there. You got to get up there. It's one of the most beautiful places in the state. It's one of my favorite places to go. And so we finally made it in November, on November 3rd, right? People say, you should come in the summer, but nevertheless, it's snowing, but it's still gorgeous. And on the drive up here, it was a beautiful drive, and we're actually staying uh, at a place, at a hotel right across, I believe it's uh, from the West Bay. And so we were on this drive in, my wife, who's actually sitting right there, that's my family, um, she was telling our kids, hey guys, look out the window, it's so pretty. And all they basically were focused on was the hotel pool. And so they don't really care about the lake or anything like that. It's all about the pool. But I want to show you a picture of my family because they are some of my favorite people on this earth. And this is my family right here. And this picture is about a year old, so my kids have grown up. Uh, quite a bit, and especially my little one. She's, she looks a lot different now. But my wife Robin and I, we've been married for 13 years, and she truly is a gift to me. Um, and we have three little ones, Eliana, who's eight, Isaiah, who's six, and our little bulldozer named Mia, who is about one and a half now. But I'm originally from Vancouver, Canada, which is the real Vancouver, not the fake one in Washington State. And if you've ever been there, if you've ever heard about it, if you've ever seen pictures of Vancouver, you understand it is one of the most beautiful places on this planet. And my wife, Robin, she's from Minnesota originally. And we actually met while we were working with a humanitarian organization down in Texas called Mercy Ships. And ever since then, we've moved around a lot. From East Texas, we moved uh, overseas to uh, West Africa where we did some work there. And then we moved over to Boston and then to Minneapolis and then to Northern Jersey, just outside of New York, then to Philadelphia. And then we finally made it here to the great state of Michigan. So we are hoping to never, ever move again. But we'll see what happens. We'll see what, I, what God has for us. But as I mentioned, it's a privilege to be here. And thank you to Patrick for having me and this entire, and all of you, because you truly have been incredible hosts for this weekend. And as I mentioned, I'm really excited about this series because the mind is such a powerful thing. Because when you actually think about it, so much of our lives are dictated by our thoughts. And so as we kick off this series, I wanted to ask all of us a question. So you guys ready for it? Still with me? I heard no. Okay, my daughter just said no. She's not ready for it at all. Okay, but I'm assuming that most of you are. And so the question I want to ask you right now is what are you thinking about? At this moment, what's going through your mind right now? And you don't have to share it with me because for some of you, I don't want to know what you're thinking. But for all of us, just think about what you're thinking about. And my guess is, is that for some of you, you're looking at me thinking, I really like this guy. This guy's energetic, he's a good communicator, he's good looking, and who de wouldn't like a guy with this type of hair, right? That's what you're thinking, right? Exactly. Sort of like that, yeah, maybe. But for the rest of us who aren't thinking that, you're probably thinking about maybe for some of us the crazy morning you had. Because even with the extra hours, hour of sleep, it was still so hard trying to get your kids up, fed, dressed, and out the door. And maybe still, uh, for others of us, we're thinking about that fight that we had with our significant other on our way here or one of our children on our way here. And still for others of us, maybe we're thinking about our phone that just went off and the work email, the work text that we just got, and that's where our mind is. And for others of us, this is the last place that we wanted to be this morning. And the only reason why we came is because somebody promised to buy us lunch afterwards. And so we're thinking about where we're going to eat, what we're going to do, who and where we're going to watch the Lions game this afternoon with. And that's where our mind is. But our thoughts are incredibly important, and they are powerful. 
because they affect our emotions, our actions, and ultimately our lives. Because our mind is a battlefield. And that's what the Apostle Paul says in the passage that we're going to be looking at today. Because most of life's battles are won or lost in the mind. And so often the life that we live is a reflection of the thoughts that we think. And I love what one pastor and author by the name of Greg, Craig Groeschel said about our thoughts. And I also, something that I want to um, mention and something that I want to recognize is that many of the thoughts that we're going to be hearing in this message, I'm indebted to him because he has some great thoughts, especially on this topic. But this is what he said about our thoughts. He said, your life is moving. Our lives are moving in the direction of our strongest thoughts. And so what this means is, is that if we want to change our life, we have to change our thinking. Change our thinking and we will change our life. And so we, as we kick off this series today, the question that we want to wrestle with today is this. Where are your thoughts taking you? Where are our thoughts taking us? And when you think about the thoughts that you think on an everyday basis, are they moving you to your desired destination? Are they moving you to the future that you desire? And if the answer is no, I have some good news for you. Because in the passage that we're looking at today, the Apostle Paul tells us very, explicit, very clearly how we can begin to move in a different direction. And the passage that we're going to be looking at today, it actually comes from a book in the New Testament called 2 Corinthians. And 2 Corinthians was originally a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to a church community in the Greek city, in the ancient Greek city of Corinth, way back in the first century A.D. And this was a church community that Paul had st started years before he ever wrote this letter. But what happened was, was that after Paul left the city and he went and he traveled to all these different places to start churches there as well. After he left, there was a group of people that infiltrated that community that started spreading lies about who he was and about what it meant to follow Jesus. And so for this community, after that happened, things started going south. They, ex they started experiencing a lot of problems. And Paul heard about these issues. He would receive reports from people. He would receive letters, all of this, saying that things were not going well. And so what he did was that he sent, he wrote, and he sent multiple letters to this community. He even visited them once to try to get them back on track. And this book that we call 2 Corinthians was actually the third letter that he wrote to them. And in this letter, he talks about the mind. He talks about the importance of of our thoughts. And this is part of what he says. He says, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. And so the image that Paul gives us is that he gives us an image of war to describe what happens in our minds. And he tells us that in this war, that even though we live in the natural world, we have access to supernatural weapons. And these weapons, he describes them in saying that these weapons, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. And this word power, the Greek word that's translated power is the word dunamis. And it's where we get the English word dynamite from. And it's used to describe the explosive, the miraculous power of God. And this, these are the weapons that we have access to, that we can take a hold of. And what these weapons are able to do is that they are able to demolish strongholds. And that word stronghold isn't a word that we use a lot in our culture, at least not for me. But the way that Paul is using the word stronghold is he uses it to describe a protected, a fortified, a reinforced prison. And he's telling us that when we believe lies, lies about who we are and about who God is, that we find ourselves locked up in this type of prison by these lies. And I love what one scholar had to say. He wrote that when we're in this type of stronghold, we're a prisoner locked by deception. That's the type of prison that he's talking about. But you know what the great news is? What he also tells us is that this doesn't have to be our reality. We don't have to be a prisoner that's held hostage by our lies because we don't have to believe these lies. We can, in fact, crush, we can demolish these lies, and we can be free from them. But if this is the direction that we want to move in our lives and we want to experience this freedom, there's something very important that we have to do. We have to be able to recognize the lie. We have to be able to recognize the stronghold. We have to, we have to be able to do this. We have to be able to determine the deception. 
We have to identify the lie that is holding us back, keeping us locked up, preventing us from moving forward and experiencing what God desires in our life. And I had a terrible high school experience. I hated every minute of high school. And because of what I experienced in my high school years, I believed so many lies about who I was. And it really kept me from experiencing what God wanted me to experience in that season of my life. And if somebody asked me in high school to describe myself, and if I was dead honest with them, I probably would have used five words. I probably would have said that I was fat, ugly, worthless, rejected, and alone. Because that's how I truly felt. And as I mentioned, I grew up in Vancouver. And Vancouver has a large Asian population, which meant that I grew up surrounded by short, skinny Asian people. But I was not short and I was not skinny as a high school student. And so I remember that there was a handful of people at my school who would regularly come up, up to me and say, why are you so fat? Why are you so obese? And they would say this to me, not every day, but pretty regularly. And every single time, I would try to laugh it off because I didn't want them to see how much they hurt me. And at first, I didn't believe it. But after hearing it over and over and over again, I began to internalize it. And I began to believe it. Because you know what? If they're saying it, it must be true. And also in high school, I had terrible acne. And so on a lot of days, it was, it was so bad that I refused to even leave my house. And when I would have a conversation with someone, I wouldn't look them in the eye because I was so embarrassed. And like most high school boys, I like girls. But I remember on a lot of mornings before I would go to school, I would look at myself in the mirror and think to myself, who would want this? But probably the worst thing that happened in high school was that for two and a half long years, I was bullied. Worst experience of my life. It impacted me physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, every aspect of who I was. It was a terrible experience. And it got so bad that I can't even remember the number of times I seriously thought about taking my own life. And almost every single night, I would go through this routine where before I would go to sleep, I would sit on my bed and I would pray. And almost every single night, what, that would end up, what would end up happening was I would just sit there asking God the same question over and over and over again. And what that question was, was, God, why did you have to take my dad? Because my dad passed away of stomach cancer when I was four. And as a teenager, I believe that if my dad had still been alive, that I wouldn't have been bullied, or at the very least, it wouldn't have gone on for two and a half years. Because as my dad, he would have shown me what I was supposed to do as a man because I had no idea. Or he would have stepped in and he would have stopped it because he was my dad and he loved me. But he wasn't around. And during those two and a half years, I had no friends at school. I was totally alone. And so during recess and lunch, I remember I would spend most of them um, in this area of our school where our woodworking and metalworking shops were. And nobody hung out there because there were no lockers there. But I went there and I would just spend time by myself doing homework, doing who knows what. Because I knew that at least if I was there, these guys who were making myself so incredible, my life so incredibly miserable, at least they couldn't find me. It's two and a half years of my high school experience. That's, that's what happened. And I remember about a year and a half ago, we did a series called Defining Moments. And I told my story as a part of that series. And I had to submit a picture for that series. And I remember being in my room, just digging through my pictures. And I found a picture of myself from back in my high school years. And this is it. And when I saw that picture for the first time in years, all those memories, all those emotions, all of that just came flooding back. It's just just thing, it just triggered all of that. But these are the lies that I believed for so long. These are the lies that held me hostage. These are the lies that held me as a prisoner. These are the lies that held me back from moving forward and experiencing more of what God had for me. And so let me ask all of us this morning, what are the strongholds in our lives? What is the stronghold in your life? What are the lies that you have believed? Maybe it's that you're not good enough. Maybe it's that you think and that you believe that because you've done way too many horrible things, hurt too many people in the past, that God could never, ever want you, that God could never love you, that God could never, ever use you. Or maybe you're similar to me. And for years, you have believed that who you are is that you are rejected, worthless, and alone. 
But what are these lies that have held you back from moving forward and experiencing and living the life that God has created you to live? Because what we have to do that is that when it comes to these lies, we first have to define it, that if we actually want to defeat it. We have to determine the deception. And when we do, then God is able to do something that is truly extraordinary, something that only he can do, is that he is able to demolish that stronghold. He is able to destroy the lie. And this is what the Apostle Paul says. He says something very important. He says, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And this is the important part that we want to talk about for the next few moments. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. And so Paul continues to use this image of war. And he tells us that when it comes to every thought that enters into our mind, we are supposed to take it captive. Every lie, every distortion, every half-truth that enters into our minds, we are to take it captive as a prisoner of war. And the Greek word for captive is to arrest or to seize using a sword or a spear. And what's so interesting to me is that it reminds me, it reminded me of another letter that Paul wrote, something else that he said in a different letter that he wrote that we also have in our New Testament called Ephesians. And in Ephesians, he tells us that as followers of Jesus, we are in a spiritual battle. And in this battle, God hasn't left us hanging, but he's actually given us armor to help us. He's given us the helmet of salvation the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth. Our feet are fitted with the gospel of peace. We have a shield of faith, and we also have the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And all of this armor is defensive, except for one, the sword of the Spirit, which, as I mentioned, is the word of God. And with this sword, what we are supposed to do, we are to take captive or to arrest or to seize every thought that is not from God, every lie. And so when a distortion enters into our mind, when a lie enters into our mind, what we're supposed to do is we are to call it out. We're to identify that lie and to recognize, you know what? This isn't who God says he is. This isn't who God says I am. So I'm not going to choose to believe it. I'm not going to choose to move in this direction because it does not lead to God's destination. It's to call it out in that way and to say, you know what? I'm not going to choose to believe, think and to believe this, but I'm going to choose to think and believe who he tells us, who, who he tells me I am, and who he tells me he is in his word. I'm going to choose to believe that he's good, that he's loving, that he'll never leave me or abandon me, that he for, he's forgiven me, that he hears my prayers. And because this is who he is, who I am, is that I am loved, I am accepted, I am valued, I am worthy, I am forgiven. I'm going to choose to believe this, and I'm going to choose to move in this direction. Because if we want to experience this freedom in our lives, this is what we have to do. Because what our thoughts will do is our thoughts will move us either away from God or towards Him. And so if we want to move towards Him and experience true freedom, true peace, true joy, true love, true purpose and meaning, we have to do these two things. We have to determine the deception, which we already talked about, but we also have to do this. We have to determine a new direction. We have to begin to move in a completely new way. Not choose to believe this lie and continue down that path, but, continue, but actually to begin to create an alternate path and move towards truth. And Paul also says this in this book that we have in the New Testament called the Book of Romans, and he writes this. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. And what he's saying is don't think the, world the, way the, the way the world thinks. Don't believe what the world believes. Don't move in the direction the world is moving. But rather, be transformed. How? By the renewing of our minds. And the way that our minds are renewed is by allowing God to transform them, doing what we've been talking about this morning, determining the deception, determining to move in a new direction. And there's actually a scientific explanation for this, which I think is so beautiful, because when Paul wrote these words, and we're going to touch on it again later, he didn't realize any of this. He didn't know any of this. But there's actually a scientific explanation. When we do these two things, there's a physiological change that happens in our brains. And we're going to be hearing from a, um, a uh, psychologist, a clinical psychologist named Dr. Latanya Carter, and she has some powerful insights 
into the mind and what happens when we actually put these two practices into play in our lives. So let's take a look at this video. Well, Dr. Carter, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm so excited to be able to talk with you a little bit about this. And today what we've been doing is we've been talking about the power and the influence of our thought life. And specifically, one of the ideas that we've talked about is what it looks like to take our thoughts captive and to renew our minds so that we move in a healthy direction. And so my question for you is like, scientifically, what does that actually mean? And how does that happen in our brains? Right, yeah. So let me give you a little bit of a a neuroscience lesson really quick, okay? Um, So the emotions that we experience are housed in our amygdala, which is in the back of the brain. And when we experience a triggering event in the environment, our amygdala lights up um, and it starts sending uh, messages to other parts of our brain for us to react in order to basically extinguish that emotion. So usually it starts, the chain reaction starts with an emotion and it ends with some type of behavior. Neuroplasticity, which is what you're alluding to, um, is the ability to be able to change how our brain reacts and respond to um, a, a triggering event. So for for decades, researchers thought that once we reach adulthood, our brain stopped developing, it stopped changing. And so in recent years, they've discovered that that's not the case. And even more exciting is that we have power and influence over how our brain works. So if we look at, a, at an example of someone maybe with social anxiety, so for them, the triggering event might be joining a small group. You know, that's going to trigger a lot of anxiety, a lot of fear. Um, they're going to be afraid of judgment. People are going to be, um, they're not going to like me, whatever the case is, right? And so the response to that might be avoidance. I'm not going to go to the small group because I'm afraid of what's going to happen. But when I don't go to the small group, my anxiety decreases, the amygdala stops reacting, and and that's the end of it. So with neuroplasticity, we can um, make a change. And so we can change the neural pathway so that it goes to a different response. And we do that through engaging the prefrontal cortex, which is it's in the front of the brain. That's where we make decisions, we problem solve, um, we go through uh, executive functioning features, things like that. So when we, the same example, social anxiety comes into play, um, we want to join the small group. So instead of avoiding, which is our original reaction, instead we decide, um, I'm going to think through why I'm afraid. Right, I'm gonna break down these fears. I'm gonna come up with a plan so that my new reaction will be to go to small group, but um, maybe do some coping skills to manage my anxiety while I'm there. Okay, so in doing that, we've created a new pathway. Okay. We're no longer just avoiding going to small group. Now we're gonna go and we're gonna have a plan to control the anxiety. And the more we repeat that pairing of you know the emotion with the new behavior, the stronger the connections get. So another idea that we're talking about is specifically shifting from like one pattern or direction of thinking to another. And then scripture, again, as we already said, talks about this as like renewing of your mind or thinking in a different way. But from your perspective, like what does the actual renewal process look like? And then what role do these patterns play in our lives? The idea of taking every thought captive or renewing your mind actually aligns very well with cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, And certainly there are other types of therapies that you can use, you know, to renew the mind. Um, But I I think this is a good example of how it could work. Um, So CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy, the theory behind it is that our emotions are are basically determined by what we're thinking and what um, behaviors we're engaging in. And so since I can't directly change your emotion, I have to change how you think and how you behave in order to affect your emotion. So CBT, um, in that process, we literally, through therapeutic exercises, take the thoughts captive. So we evaluate um, the repetitive thoughts that we sometimes have, um, and we evaluate them for truth to determine if this is a true thought or if it's a distorted thought. And then we reframe or restructure that thought based on the new evidence that we've discovered. So for example, we might have a thought that um, I'm flawed or I'm damaged. Mm -hmm. And so that thought causes a lot of depression symptoms, right? 
And so we'll evaluate that thought, we'll take it captive, and we'll look at the evidence. Okay, how do we know that this thought is true, and how do we know that it's false? And for Christians, this is a great way to introduce scripture. So we can go to the Bible, we can look at the ways that we are made, um, you know, fearlessly and wonderfully made. We can look at scriptures that counter the negative thoughts that we're having and use that as evidence. And then we reframe the thought or restructure it so it's no longer... Um, I'm flawed or I'm damaged, but it's, I was flawed, but now through Christ, I'm made whole, okay. right? So we have literally changed sure. our thought patterns and our thought thinking. Yeah, that's great. So I know like personally for me, I, I want to get better at this. This doesn't always come, kind of come in and I'm, I'm very good at not evaluating those thoughts <laughs> at times, right? But I think for me, I would go like, how do I make sure that I'm kind of creating more self-awareness and more self-regulation when it comes to the mind? And then how can I be more intentional about creating better pathways and that way. Right. So we've talked about therapy as being an option, and I think that's definitely applicable for people who um, have more of the clinical levels of anxiety or depression or things like that. Um, but in general, everybody can form new pathways, right? So doing things like um, self-care, you know, developing a routine of self-care. And in my opinion, any routine of self-care should include exercises for the mind, the body, and the spirit. Um, and so you might buy a journal and start, you know, tracking your thoughts and recording how you're feeling, um, what you're thinking about, especially if you've had a day or a week where you're really emotional. A lot of times we just kind of get to the weekend and we're like, oh, great, I don't have to think about that anymore, I'm good. Sure. Um, and we don't take the time to really reflect on what was happening. Um, so when we reflect on our emotions and we think about what triggers that, you know, we can start to ask our questions about, okay, how did I arrive at this outcome? Um, I was feeling anxious and then all of a sudden, you know, I'm eating a pound of ice cream. You know, how does this happen, right? Um, that would not be me. <laughs> no, No, okay. never, 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 never. <laughs> uh, But those are, those are exercises where you can choose, now that you understand the, the connection between the emotion and the behavior, sure. you can choose to do something differently and that's going to form a new pathway. Um, learning new activities also, you know, complex uh, activities like learning an instrument or learning a foreign language, those create new pathways. Anything, anytime we're learning something new, um, even Bible study, if we're doing Bible study and, and we're engaging critical thinking skills, those are forming new pathways. Um, and of course, eating healthy and exercising, those produce um, you know, happy hormones in our brains that actually counter some of the negative feelings that we're having. Yeah, that's great. Dr. Carter, thank you so much for thank being you. with us. Thank you so much. And I love what she had to say about what we're talking about. She gives us so much insight into it from a scientific perspective, providing us an explanation. And Dr. Carter has some really powerful thoughts and insights into this whole idea of the mind. And so I'm excited that we're going to be hearing from her throughout this entire series. But what she said about what we're talking about today is that when we actually do these two things and we determine the deception and we determine a new direction, there's something incredible that happens in our minds and that there are new, uh, new neural pathways that are created. And there are actually, our, our brain is actually rewired, which is amazing to think about. But something that's also so important for us to keep in mind is that this cannot be just a one-time thing, but rather it has to be a continual process. And I remember learning in college because uh, I was a biology major in college, so that was, as you can imagine, that was money well spent. Um, but I was a biology major and I took this one class in neurobiology in my senior year, and I thought it was so incredibly fascinating. And what I learned in that class is that when we as human beings learn new information, just like we heard from Dr. Carter, a new neural pathway is created. And so, for example, when a child learns that 2 plus 2 equals 4, a new pathway is created in their brain. And as they continue to learn it, as they continue to think about it, as they continue to study this information, that pathway becomes stronger and stronger and stronger until it just becomes automatic. And so somebody, they could just be walking to school one day and somebody could just jump out from behind a tree and say, what's two plus two? And they would just automatically know, you know what, it's four, without even having to think about it because that pathway has become so strong. And it's similar with other information as well. And that when we think and when we choose to believe that who we are is that we are rejected, that we are worthless, that we are alone. The first time we think and believe this, a, a pathway is created in our brains. But as we continue to think and believe that information, what happens is that pathway becomes stronger and stronger and stronger until it becomes our default thought. And so somebody could ask us, 
Like somebody could have asked me in high school, who do you think you are? Who do you believe you are? Describe yourself to me. And I would have used those words because that was my default thought. And it might be the case for some of us here is that we have believed, we have thought lies about ourselves for so long. Now it's just automatic. That is who we believe we are. But if we want to choose a different way, if we want to think in a different way, if we want to live in a different way, what we have to do is that we have to be willing to create an alternate pathway. And as we continue to think and believe something different, what will happen is, is that this pathway will begin to atrophy. It'll begin to weaken. And then this pathway will get, become stronger and stronger and stronger. And then that'll become our default thinking, where we don't think, you know what? I'm not rejected. I'm accepted. I'm not worthless, but I have incredible value because I'm a child of God. I'm not alone, but God promises me that he is always with me and that he will never leave me, never abandon me. So I'm going to choose to move in this direction. I'm going to choose to believe this. And as we continue to do so, that is who we begin to believe who we are. And the incredible thing is, is that the Apostle Paul actually says this. He says exactly what Dr. Carter was talking about, exactly what I just told you about. And he didn't know any of this neurobiology stuff. And this is what he said in that verse that we looked at earlier. He said, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And that word renewing, it's in the present tense in the Greek. And what that means is, is that he's telling us we have to continually do this. It's not just a one-time decision we make where we say, oh, you know what? I'm going to believe this now. And suddenly we believe it. That's not how it works. You know this and I know this. But rather, we have to make these decisions every single day, multiple times a day. That when lies enter into our mind, we have to say, no, I'm not going to choose to believe that. I'm not going to choose to move down this path. But rather, I'm going to choose this, God's truth, and continue to move in this direction. That's how we renew our minds. That's what Paul is talking about. And so when it comes to renewing our minds, when it comes to doing what we've been talking about, these two principles that we've been talking about today, I want to submit to you, I want to suggest to all of us two ways that we can do so in our everyday life. And the first is, is that we have to learn the truth. We have to understand what God says about who he is and about who we are. And how this comes about is by reading, it could be listening, writing, it could be memorizing God's truth the Word of God, the Bible, and engaging with it every single day. And the very first church that I worked at, my boss made everyone on staff memorize Bible verses. And I hated doing it. And we were serious about this because it was a Korean church, and so we were like militant about it. And so we would, every single Tuesday morning, we would come and we would go through our memory verses. And if we got even one word wrong, the motivation for actually doing this was that we would have to pay a dollar for every word that we got wrong. It was like that. And we ended up memorizing hundreds of Bible verses. I had a flashcard stack of like this many flashcards, and I would just go through them every day because I didn't want to pay any money. And I had a, like I said, I had a terrible attitude when we first started doing this. And I was thinking to myself, why do I have to do this? Why do I have to memorize the Bible? Why can't I just read it? But then I saw the beauty of what came from it. And I remember on certain days, I would feel like a total failure. I would feel like I'm awful at my job. I feel so inadequate. I feel so insecure. And then one of the Bible verses that I had memorized would just pop into my mind. Where God would say, you know what? <laughs> Like, your adequacy comes from me. Your sufficiency comes from me. I am the source of that. You're not a failure, but you're accepted in me. And through these verses, God would say, you know what? Don't move down this pathway. Don't choose to think and believe this, but rather choose to live in a different way. Start moving in this direction because this is the better way to live. This is the way to life. But if we actually want to choose this way, we have to be willing to do this. We have to learn the truth. We have to understand what is that alternate pathway. And we not only have to learn it, but we also have to remember it. And after the first service, a gentleman named Max gave me this cross. And it's just so incredibly beautiful. And it so perfectly describes what we're talking about right now. Because he told me, when you look at the cross, remember. And he actually gave me um, this sort of card as well. And this is what it says on this card. And that this cross is a reminder that when I hold it in my hand, no problem is too difficult for God to understand. 
It brings me hope and comfort as I go about my day because I think of Jesus. I'm reminded of Jesus as I cling to it and pray. Whenever I'm weary or tired or I'm burdened by life's cares, the cross reminds me that God listens to my prayers. I count my blessings one by one, and then I understand, just like the cross, God holds me in the palm of his hand. And what this cross is, the purpose of this cross is that the reason why he gave it to me was that he said, remember the truth. That we not only have to learn it, but we also have to remember it. And that when these lies enter into our minds, to remember that is not who we are. That's not who God says he is. So let's choose a different way to live. Because he gave it to me. And so I'm going to put this up in my office and to remember that every single time I see this, there is a different way to think and to believe. But in addition to learning the truth, what we also have to do is we also have to speak the truth to one another. And that we have to have other people in our lives who communicate who God says we are and who God says he is to us through their words and through their actions. And the whole bullying thing in high school, it did a number on me. And for years after that, I had zero self-confidence, zero self-esteem. And after college, I went to work for a humanitarian organization called Mercy Ships. And with that organization, I met some incredible people. People who did exactly this for me. People who told me, you know what, you're not rejected, but you're accepted. You're not, you're not worthless, but you have incredible value as a child of God. People who said, you're not alone, but you know what, we are with you. And God is with you as well. And through them doing this in my life, I, it opened my eyes to see that for so many years, I have been traveling down this path and choosing to believe these lies, choosing to be locked up in this stronghold, in this prison. And they showed me that there is a better way to live, a different way to live, that you don't have to move in this direction, but rather you can move in this direction and experiencing God's freedom in my life. And this is what they did for me. But what's so important to understand is that we not only have to have these people in our lives, we also need to be these people for others. Because for every single one of us here, we can do this every single day. We can communicate God's truth to other people. The fact that we are loved, that we are accepted, that we are forgiven, that we are free, that we have purpose and meaning, we can communicate this. We can communicate this to our children, to our spouse, to our neighbors, to our coworkers, to the person who's checking us out at the grocery store. This is the incredible privilege that we have. Because when we have this knowledge, when God gives us this knowledge about who we are, we're not just simply to hold it for ourselves so that we can live a better life, a more comfortable and easier life. But the reason why he gives us things is that rather so we can go out and share it with the world around us. We can do this and then just invite people to experience freedom, the life that God has created them to live. And so the bottom line for today that I would love for all of us to take away is this bottom line of today. Our lives move in the direction of our thoughts. That's why our thoughts are so incredibly powerful. Because the life that we live is a reflection of the thoughts that we think. And that is so true. Because what comes into our mind will most often come out of our life. And so if we actually want to live a positive life, we cannot do so that when we actually have a negative mind. And so if this is how you are thinking and you're thinking, you know what? I do believe lies about who I am. I do believe lies about who God is. What are we supposed to do? Do what we've talked about today, what Paul tells us to do. We have to determine the deception and then we have to choose to determine a new direction, to move in a totally new way. Take these thoughts captive and replace them with the truth. Because what God's truth is able to do is something that is truly extraordinary. And this is what Jesus says, and we'll close with this. He tells us this is the power of God's truth, and you will know the truth. And what does the truth do? The truth will set us free. Let's bow our heads and pray. God, we thank you for your truth. We thank you that you have spoken this into our life to define reality, to give us hope, to tell us who you are, how deeply you love us and who we are, God. And so we pray 
that we would do the things that we talked about today, that we would learn this truth and that we would remember it. Because as Jesus said, the truth, what it will do, it will set us free. It will set us free to live in a completely new way, the life that you have created and destined and dreamed for us to live. But at the same time, Lord, that help us to also have people speak truth into our lives, but help us to also be the people who communicate your truth to others. That we would be people who are also communicate the life that can be found in you through our words and through our actions. So we thank you for your truth. We thank you for your presence in our lives and that we don't have to continue to live our lives believing lies and locked up in this prison and held hostage, but that we can experience your freedom. And so we thank you and we pray these things in your son's name. Amen. And so we're going to sing a great song called Sons and Daughters, and it really summarizes so perfectly the journey that we've been on today. And so if you are able, I'd love for you to join us by standing up and let's sing this out together.
together one last time. Every voice. Let's hear it. Here we are. We are the sons. We are the daughters of God. No matter where we go, we're close to the Father's heart. And though we stumble, He will not let us fall. Thanks so much for singing with us. Uh, can we give Andrew Kim a round of applause and thank him? Thanks so much, man. So great hearing from you. And uh, as we close, I'm just going to pray a blessing over us, and then you guys can be uh, dismissed. Lord, thank you so much for what you shared. God, we pray that as we continue to unpack the thoughts from today's message, as we continue to reflect on what you're speaking to us, God, that we would do the work, God, that you would compel us and that you would bring things in our life that would remind us of those pathways that you've called us to focus on and the pathways you've called us to just back away from, Lord. I just pray, Father, that you would just be with us as we go from this place and bring to remembrance the things that we need to be focusing on and help us to do the work, God. We ask these things in Jesus' name and everyone said... Amen. Thanks so much for being here. Have a wonderful week. Part two of Master of Mind is next week, 9 or 11 a.m. Have a great day. For uh, joining us online. Those of you who join in the conversation on our Facebook live chat, all the other mediums like Instagram, Twitter, sharing the content, all of the different uh, ways that you guys engage by commenting, liking what we're putting out there. It means a lot. So thank you so much for doing that. Uh, like I said earlier, join us next week for part two of Mastermind. Uh, and we'll look forward to seeing you then, 9 or 11. And we encourage you also, join us here in the room if you can make it. We'd love to experience a service with you in person. Have a great day.